Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you all to the AAFLFC podcast and to welcome Patrick Lacroix, uh, our distinguished guest today. Um, Patrick Lacroix, PhD, is a former Fulbright Fellow and former instruction at Phillips Exeter Academy. He has also taught at post-secondary institutions in New Hampshire, Quebec, and Nova Scotia. As a scholar of U.S. religious history, Dr. Lacroix studies faith-based activism and its role in 20th century political realignments. His first monograph, John F. Kennedy and the Politics of Faith, University Press of Kansas 2021, finds in the early 1960s a rapid shift in religious discourse that produced a new political and ideological landscape. That shift owed to the election of the first Catholic president and to Kennedy's approach to the treacherous issue of church-state relations while in office. Dr. Lacroix has brought historical perspective to the current state of religious activism in a number of outlets, including the History News Network, Time.com, The Washington Post, and The Concord Monitor. Dr. Lacroix is also a leading scholar of Franco-American history with refereed articles in such journals as the Catholic Historical Review, the Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, and the Revue d'Histoire de l'Amérique Française. A native of Quebec, he has sought to highlight points of intersection in Canadian and American national histories by studying migration and other encounters across the international border. Dr. Lacroix's website is at clearingpast.com. And really spectacular news, recent news, is that his most recent book, Tout nous serait possible, Une histoire politique des Franco-Américains, uh, 1874 à 1945, Presse de l'Université Laval. Congratulations, Dr. Lacroix. Uh, such a, a wonderful um, background and expertise you bring to your work. And what a wonderful year for you with two monographs published and both from distinguished university presses. Um, the Presse de l'Université Laval is especially near and dear to me. I'm an undergrad and grad alum of Université Laval, and which is why I have a picture of my uh, beloved uh, Quebec behind me. And, um, you know, I'm just so happy to have you here today with us. Um, could you start off by telling us about how you first became interested in advocacy for the French language and Francophone culture? Sure, and thank you. Uh, first, thank you for having me on and, uh, and for that generous introduction as well. And of course, I share your enthusiasm for uh, bilingualism, trilingualism, et cetera, and language education. I had the immense fortune and privilege of growing up in a household where I was exposed to French and English, where I could watch Sesame Street and then Passepartout and Star Trek and then Goods Monde or something along those lines. So it was really, it really expanded my horizons. And I believe in bilingualism at the very least as a, a tremendous career tool, but it also broadens our horizons in a larger cultural sense. It brings other worlds to us brings us into different cultural worlds and to partake in different cultural experiences. Um, and I certainly feel that from my own education, my own experience in my parents' household, who really made sure that both my sister and I were exposed to both languages. Um, I think that overall bilingualism and language education makes us much more compassionate. And I'm not saying that unilingual people aren't or don't have you know, those characteristics, that, that sensitivity to other cultures, but it helps. It's a valuable tool, um, and it's a great way of, of bridging borders. Um, that's what I found the most. Uh, you know, I, I love Quebec, and I love the, the larger North American Francophone world, um, but really, I wouldn't have been able to achieve what I have um, and to become a more worldly person, a hopefully a more um, well-rounded person without having the other part of that equation of having a second language. So whatever the two languages are, or three languages or four languages, it's, a, it's worthwhile in so many respects. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, please tell us now a little bit about your work 
your research work and your work as a scholar and writer? Certainly. Uh, I'd start off as, as you did with uh, my work at UNH at the University of New Hampshire, where I looked at religious history, especially modern American religious history. Uh, that's something I had explored to a certain extent, not to not quite to the same level, um, through my master's program at Rock University um, in St. Catharines, Ontario. But I expanded that and I was really keen on looking at the Cold War period um, and ended up focusing on the president to whom I was at first initially entirely indifferent, John F. Kennedy, but he grew on me and really enjoyed studying him. But as you, you know, it, as you mentioned earlier, uh, and this is why I suppose I'm here, I've done a lot of research on Francophone immigration, Francophone diasporas, um, and just people of French heritage generally in North America. I started off doing research on this field in 2012, so it's been almost a decade that I've been immersed in um, really wonderful, enlightening documentation about our collective history um, as uh, a border, as a people that's been crossed by the border and people who've crossed borders as well. And initially what I was doing in my research was looking at uh, Franco-American religious controversies. So that's where the kind of the point of intersection with mm -hmm. my other field uh, really occurred. Uh, so Franco-American religious controversies in the 18, uh, 1880s with the Flynn Affair, 1890s with uh, Cahensleyism, and then in the early 20th century with corporation soul controversy, controversy in Maine. Um, I'll spare your, your audience or our audience for today um, with regard to all those controversies, but there's a lot of information online. So I wrote peer reviewed articles on those subjects. But since then, and especially in the last four or five years, I've been more interested in exposing the sheer diversity of this French heritage world in North America. So looking beyond um, older histories that were very monolithic and showing how sometimes fractured this community is, but also how prevalent it is across the North American continent, the variety of encounters it had with other cultures and um, doing that over the course of a few centuries. So I've started looking at the early 19th century and I'll be talking about that in a few presentations next year. Long before the Civil War, French Canadians were adventuring on American soil and having encounters with Yankees and other ethnic groups. And um, also looking beyond traditional large mill towns, the ones that Franco-Americans in the Northeast are most familiar with, places like Lewiston and Manchester. Fascinating stories there, but a lot of work has been done. So I felt as though my contribution could be a lot more helpful by looking at smaller regional centers like Plattsburgh, Barrie, Vermont, and Berlin, New Hampshire. So I've kind of been trying to push as much as I can the uh, boundaries of our field to show how um, rich and again, diverse uh, Franco-American history really is. You know, I, I think that that um, your, your comments on diversity, just as the global Francophone world is very diverse, so too is the Francophone uh, world in North America. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Lacroix. Um, you know, um, you've covered a little of this, um, but if you could share your thoughts on the role and status of the French language and Francophone culture in North America and specifically in the US. I know you've touched upon this, but if you could tell us a little bit more what you think. I think it's a really exciting time because we've learned it in the larger French Canadian world or people of French Canadian and Acadian descent to decenter France. So for a long time, that was the model and the way for this ethnic community to gain prestige was to associate itself with France, with Paris, with the metropole, which was a lot more iconic, I guess, in the American imagination. Um, that's where, you know, status came from, from the metropole, from France itself. But we've learned to go beyond that and to accept different varieties of the French language, different dialects, different idioms, um, different intonations in the French language, some of which are more um, unique to North America. And we've learned to engage a little bit more with um, the larger Francophone community. Uh, as you were mentioning just now, the global Francophonie, so Haitian communities in the US, people who uh, claim Cajun or Creole background, um, Claire Maribisson has taught us to look a little bit more at the Midwestern uh, French heritage communities uh, that we have in, in Michigan and the Upper Northwest um, uh, or Upper Midwest. 
so there's a lot there, and especially you know, coming to you from Maine, we now have uh, West African Francophone immigrants who are enriching um, Francophone traditions in, in this part of the country. So it's been really wonderful to use France, to use French, the French language, to dialogue with these different cultures. That's something we have in common, and it's a pathway to greater understanding and a great way of forging, you know, not to be purely pragmatic about it, but to forge alliances um, so that we can band together to try to um, promote bilingualism, to promote French language education. I think there's a lot of value in that. So, you know, it's been really wonderful to be here in Maine. It's been wonderful the last few years to be in Nova Scotia and to encounter Acadian communities as well. So all that to say, in a very roundabout way, to speak to <laughs> your question about, you know, the role and presence of the French language, it's a presence that's everywhere if you start looking for it. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can do with that strength in numbers um, that we currently have. And the open-mindedness, the recognition that every culture has its own legitimacy, that's very empowering and very exciting. You know, I am constantly impressed. Uh, I learn every day something new about really to what extent French is everywhere. And we don't necessarily realize that we're caught up in our busy schedules. But when you stop to think and you stop to look around you, it is uh, amazing and quite wonderful. Okay, so now, as you know, and I know you know this, between 10 million and 20 million in the US have claimed French ancestry. Over 2 million speak French in the home. Now, what advice would you have based on really all of your experience and expertise, what advice would you have for French language communities, advocates, stakeholders who are working to support and promote the role and presence of French language and culture in the US? As a researcher and as a historian, uh, I think there's a lot more that we can do to highlight historical and present points of intersection between cultures, um, between peoples, and that's all. That hasn't always been done, especially in the Northeast. Uh, ethnic history is still very much siloed. So people usually engage in the field trying to draw out the very specific um, historical experience of one group instead of exploring how immersed that group might have been in larger culture or how different ethnic groups might have come together to um, partner politically, economically, economically um, in strikes, in ethnic celebrations, you name it or simply within households through intermarriage. Um, so I think that we can do more of that. Um, and this is not to say that, you know, we have to approach it from a melting pot uh, approach because as, few, as great as fusion, cultural fusion is, uh, we shouldn't assume that, you know, the, the direction of history is to push us towards always greater culturation or greater assimilation, but really to look at all these different cultures and their engagement to show positive examples to current generations, positive examples of successful intercultural dialogue to model that and to use language to do so. Um, but sometimes that exchange occurred, you know, across language barriers and so forth. So I think we need to just move past what some friends and I call the gloom and doom narrative. Um, and if we have more examples that we can draw out in our history books, um, not to erase any negative history, but to show that sometimes it's feasible and all it takes is a little bit of empowerment. It's all within us to um, bridge those boundaries that you know are always popping up and keeping us apart. So um, I think that as a researcher, um, that's what really interests me, not to, again, negate any of the negative experiences that ethnic groups have faced and still face, um, but to show how we can move beyond those situations of conflict. That is wonderful advice. Thank you so much. Um, so now, while French and language and Francophone culture, as you know, are present throughout the US, the New England states uh, where you are located and Louisiana are among the areas with the highest percentage of the population of French speaking heritage. Um, how do you envision the present and the future of French language and Francophone culture in New England and then across the country? I suppose my answer here would be the corollary to what I was just describing. So it's very easy to get into the rut of pessimism, of defeatism, uh, partly because we look to the past and we have the sense that, you know, our 
immigrant ancestors um, or people of prior generations were much more attached to their culture, much more attached, whether it was from a religious perspective or not, to their language, to their customs, to their faith. Um, so it's very easy to look back, even just a few generations in New England, and to say, oh, well, look at this decline, and the culture is disappearing, and, you know, we're, it's basically the end. And, you know, every other year in Quebec, there's a big news article that says exactly that. Um, and New England is kind of used as, um, uh, I'm searching for the exact term, but um, a cautionary tale, I guess, is what I'm looking for to say, well, this is what happened abroad. So in Quebec, we need to, you know, preserve our language in this or that way. That's very detrimental to the New England community when you're constantly being used by other groups to say, well, your culture isn't what it used to be. The reality, as Jesse Martineau has many times argued, is that it has changed. It has evolved. There's been some sort of metamorphosis, if you will, but the culture is still there. And you just have to look at the amazing blogs and podcasts, um, all the great articles being written, people using new technologies to share their story. Um, we're just, you know, we're talking a few weeks after, first of all, Poutine Fest, which was again this year a giant success down in Merrimack, New Hampshire. And that's right, exactly. As well as the Youth Franco-American or Young Franco-American Summit, which took place in this state, in Maine. So there's a lot of energy. And I think that um, we need to really focus on that and create that narrative, right? Nothing succeeds like success. And young people aren't going to be interested in the Franco-American story if we're telling them, well, it's over. Um, so I think that engaging them and showing them that there's a rich heritage that is being passed down to them, that there are exciting projects, exciting activities. And of course, it's not going to look like it did in the 70s, 70s and 80s, or even in prior generations when people gathered in smoky church basements or somewhere else. Uh, it's going to look different. And each generation needs to appropriate it, its heritage and transform it and mold it into something that speaks to them. So if we can just change the narrative a little bit and show just all the exciting stuff that's actually happening, I think we'll get more people on board with uh, the idea of whether it's French immersion or just cultural preservation in general. You know, I myself, in recent readings, I read on the one hand, uh, there, I'm from the New York area. And you can probably hear that from my accent, but, um, uh, I read recently uh, a wonderful book on the fact that there have been two centuries of French education in New York. And at the, around the same time, I read an article saying there are over 80,000 uh, Francophones living in the New York City area. And that, that intersection of past and future and present is very exciting. And as you say, um, you use the term metamorphosis, you uh, use the term, I think, evolution, and they're, they're so true, absolutely. Um, now, let's see. Ah, okay. One of my favorite questions, personal favorite. As a parent, okay, I'm always interested in bilingualism and the use of additional languages in the home and family. Now, I know you had alluded to the fact that you were fortunate to have both English and French in your home, during your growing up years. And, um, you know, uh, if you could give us some of your thoughts and ideas on increasing the use of French or any other language, you know, in the family and in the community. Sure, I think it really does start with uh, parents who value cultural, cultural exchange, um, who can instill the value of bilingualism in their children. Um, and we have great role models. So having alluded to Poutine Fest, um, Tim Bollier has been on this amazing uh, language journey uh, that he can now pass on to, to his children. So has um, another important member of our Franco community, Tim Ouellette, um, and some of our friends in Quebec have done the opposite of are learning English for the first time. And some of these people are in their 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, and they're doing the hard work now so that their children don't have to, that they can bring it into the household, bring the culture into the household while their children are still quite young um, to help ease that process of language education and cultural learning. And I find that immensely inspiring. Um, I want to follow them and learn a third language or, you know, kind of kind of refine my language skills. 
partly because it does take a lot of effort. I mean, we, we won't kid ourselves, especially when you're confronted with passé simple and subjonctif for six different, you know, persons and so forth. So it, it's a it's not an easy language. And I feel fortunate that I had that luxury. Um, but I think that if we have more parents highlighting the value of that, and I understand that now it's very difficult if, you know, it's a multi-person household uh, and both parents, if there are two parents, they're both working, they're both very busy um, in the midst of the pandemic. Everyone is stressed and anxious. So I don't want to kind of overstate the case, but even just showing the value of it, uh, sharing maybe interesting podcasts with your children, um, something you can listen to on the drive. And if you can be on that language journey with your children, then they'll feel all the more invested in it. And it becomes a family activity. It becomes something you do together instead of just telling the kids, well, it will serve you eventually. Just, you know, take a French language class. It'll serve you and kind of leave them, leaving them to their own devices. Um, so I think that the more people we can have together, if it's a collective enterprise and people will be able to motivate one another and support one another, whether this happens within the household as a unit or between friends, between parents who share language resources with one another to support their kids um, or going to a daycare that has a bilingual dimension to it. Lately, there was discussion of a French immersion program here in um, upstate Maine, um, which might be supported by um, the French consulate. Hopefully we can get the Quebec government on board. Um, but ultimately it has to come from the community. So you need parents and you need children who value it. Um, it's not going to happen without them. So it's not easy. Um, I'll reckon that. But um, I think that we can, we can do a lot. And it'll be a lot easier as well if local culture is front and center in that education. So, you know, it's all great to have French teachers. But if they're teaching only Victor Hugo to Acadians, then that's not necessarily going to speak to them, although everyone should read Victor Hugo. But what I'm saying is that, you know, you want to use local resources and say, you know, this is your heritage and use local resources, local heritage to, to promote that. And that, that's something actually that the Acadian Archives is hoping to do here in Northern Maine. Um, but combining that family support, the value that comes from a collective and enterprise and mobilizing local heritage as well, all those are essential tools that can help us promote uh, language education. You know, I love everything that you have just said. Um, I especially love the fact that you talked about making language learning a joyful experience that parents and children can have fun doing it together. I think that's so, so important. And I think the fact that you highlight the importance of family, community, local culture, I mean, that is so very important in really, I think, developing the momentum for sustainable bilingualism. I, you know, I have learned so much talking with you today. It's been such a pleasure. Um, before you have to go though, um, would there be any other additional thoughts that you'd like to share with us? Sure, I guess I'd conclude by saying that very often language, and I say this as a Quebecer, is it's a very political issue. <laughs> right? uh, yes, so, I, today, today and every day, and, it, that, when, and during my student days as well. That's right, exactly. Um, and of course, for many reasons, much more so in Canada and in Quebec than here. Um, but I think it's good every now and then to take a step back and look at the larger philosophical issue behind language and not to get so much wrapped up in, you know, who said what and, you know, it's very easy to buy into inflammatory rhetoric just in general, um, especially when the news media is kind of trying to get us to, to pay more attention. But the reality is that there's a bigger philosophical issue in my mind with regard to language education, um, as I was hinting at in my, my opening remarks in the first question. Um, you know, the, it's something that enables us to transcend barriers, to get to know one another in a more personal way when we don't know the other person individually. Uh, to get to know other cultures and to enrich our own cultural background uh, without necessarily making compromises. Like everything is an ad. You're just adding to what you know of the world around you. So I think it's multifaceted. Language education is. Um, the payoff it brings is incomparable. It opens doors left and right. And again, I don't mean this in a purely economic or professional sense. Um, 
and I, I, I hope that it can all bring us, as my historical work is meant to do, bring us to greater um, mutual understanding, which goodness knows we all need more of that <laughs> these days. So if language education can be a pathway towards that, towards greater friendship, tolerance, respect, um, recognition, all the better. Beautifully said. I love the title of your newest book, Tout nous serait possible. Everything would be possible for us. Une histoire politique des Franco-Américains, a political history of the Franco-Americans. But I especially love that tout nous serait possible. That is so incredibly profound and profoundly optimistic. Thank you so much, Dr. Lacroix, for joining us today and for sharing your, your knowledge, your experience, and your insights. Thank you so much. Greatly it's been, appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. I'll say à la prochaine. <laughs> Au revoir. À la prochaine.